Ben? Well, I am uh, looking forward to having a good session with you guys today. Hope things are doing well. It is now almost September, which blows me away. Uh, the summer has gone by way too fast. Uh, let's see. Don't forget my camera or screen. Camera, you want to see my face today? Good grief. Well, there you go. You got what you asked for. I got my shirt that supports my son, my trooper son. There's my smiling face. Brenda says, where is it? Well, there it is. There it is. Happy, happy, happy. Well, I hope things are going good for you guys. Um, Cindy and I have had kind of a whirlwind summer, and we just got back last night from California. Our stay was extended there because of uh, complications with our daughter's cancer treatments and just dealing with family issues. And so it's been kind of a challenge, but we're back and looking forward to spending some time with you here this morning. Um, so just confirm, you, you should have screen, should be sharing. You should have the welcome screen and you should have my camera on. Is that right? Let's make sure that's operational before we proceed. Cool. Thanks, Don. All right, folks, here we go. Let's do a screen share and jump into what we're going to cover today. All right, screen sharing work all right. You guys are still, you're seeing the uh, introduction page to... Yes, yes. Yay, perfect. Okay, here we go. All right, our disclaimer, as we always go through, simply is trying to make sure that nobody interprets any of the things that we talk about today as being specific to trading situations, i.e. anything that you could go and trade off of. This is education, it's training. Um, trading has risks, absolute risks. No, the only trading program I've ever seen that has no risk, um, has no risk, which means there's, you don't trade. <laughs> Even if you're doing a simulated program where there's no money on the line, there's risk. Just out of curiosity, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to um, uh, interrupt this just to get some feedback, what would be the risk of trading with a simulation program? Okay, there's no money on the line. What's, what's the risk? Do you see any risk? Kind of interesting question. We'll, we'll keep going on this, but right now, while it's stuck in my head, I want to see what kind of response. What kind of risk could you run running a simulation program? Developing bad habits, Trip says. Exactly. Brenda saying it's not real. Correct. All right. Donald says you might learn something. Yes, you might. <laughs> Is that a risk? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you never learning properly due to not real impact. Okay. Okay. Good points. Good points. So there is risk. There has to be risk. Otherwise, we tend to have a skewed perspective that doesn't prepare us um, and that's actually a big part of what we're going to talk about today. So uh, just remember that the information we're providing here is not tailored to any specific individual. There is risk in trading. Um, you need to be careful about it. But we are trying to help you mitigate and limit that risk. Absolutely. That, I mean, that's the whole point of this. All right. So with that, um, we'll proceed. We have a calendar. There's always a wonderful calendar. I always throw props out there to Rob for content because content is a challenge to produce. I love seeing things like this where additional new fantastic content is being produced um, organically. So there's our buddy Trip with uh, organic development of training. Uh, this is fantastic. I love it. Essentially, I feel like I'm the result of that. 
when I got started, I was not an instructor. Uh, however, it just kind of fell into place as you learn things. And if you have a passion to help people learn and understand something, um, this kind of comes naturally. So first of all, you got to have something to say, and then you have to have a passion to do that. And I believe you have to have good internals where your motives are right. Um, and then you need opportunity. And so I love seeing Tripp have the opportunity to pass on some of the things that he has learned. I know, I know a fair amount of the journey that Tripp has taken, the effort that he's made to develop specialized knowledge and laud and, and applaud um, his efforts. and would encourage you to take advantage of this every chance you get. All right. I wanted to distill today some some wisdom on you that comes from repetition. I'm a firm believer that repetition is the mother of skill. I really believe that. However, there is huge misunderstandings about repetition and practice. I love this principle. It was taught to me many years ago. Practice does not make perfect. I heard that growing up. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. It is a, it's a misnomer, but not intentional. The, the thought behind it is right. The sentiment is genuine, I'm sure, but it's a false premise. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent, okay? So practice makes perfect? Yeah, not really. Let's change that because what we really should be saying is practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect, all right? Perfect practice makes perfect. So if practicing is going to make it permanent, perfect practice is what you want to be doing. Well, how do you do perfect practice? Well, that's what we're talking about today. You have to, because whatever you do is going to be instilled and it's not going to be valuable to you if you get really good at doing something wrong. And my little phone, I'm looking off to the side here because I forgot to mute it. Give me just a second. There we go. All right. So it raises an interesting question. So how do you learn? How do you get good at something? There's two schools of thought. There's the mentorship process and or the sink or swim process. And it's easy to see the virtues of both. Uh, you can see the, the disposition, why somebody would make the case. There is an age, age old premise that if you throw somebody in the canal they'll figure out how to swim occasionally they don't you do this there will be some people that don't figure it out and they die and you go oh my gosh we can't have anybody die so you can tend to maybe swing the pendulum uh, the other direction and in the effort of not make, making sure that nobody dies you destroy the process of learning because if there's not something on the line, learning doesn't happen very well. It becomes, it, you know, it goes back to that practice makes perfect. No, it really doesn't, but it makes permanent. There's a combination, guys, of risk and practice and mentorship that is, I believe, the most powerful in the learning process. Now, when you throw somebody in the canal, and they come out, blubbering and but they learn how to swim does it work yeah yeah it works it works why does the military do things the way they do some people look at it and say it's pretty archaic but nonetheless it works why did why do the military in virtually every country use the same type of training process for hundreds of years well because it works now could it be improved a lot of people say yes yeah we'll show you a better way but there's also the adage of dance with what brung you, or if it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's, there's legitimacy to those arguments. Okay. There really is. So the military does it because it works. It's simple. It works every time. Yeah. You have some casualties, but you accomplish what you want, which is you develop a fighting force that will follow orders and accomplish what they're supposed to do. Now, there was a time a few years ago, I know this because 
of a special forces friend of mine when the Congress, because a few people got killed in training exercises, swung the pendulum. They had the ability to do that, to influence the military, institute changes, and training became dumbed down. Uh, there was not live fire training. They didn't use actual bullets because you wouldn't want anybody to actually get, accidentally get shot. Um, and what happened was, I've told you this before, I think, but what happened was in the field, all of the exercises, the military operations that happened that you and I don't know about, that happened yesterday, that will happen tomorrow, that happened last week around the world, that you and I just don't know about. That These things are happening all the time. But the fatality rate started to go up and up. And when this finally was brought to a head, to a point, the Congress changed their minds and went back to, okay, we're causing more harm than good. So in the name of trying to be nice and protect and make sure nobody dies, they were killing more, more people. It's the law of unintended consequences. It was stupid. It was naive, but it was well-funded or well-founded. It was founded on the idea, well, we can't have anybody get hurt. And guys, you know, life doesn't work that way. And so this swing back and forth between mentorship or sink or swim is probably not the best on either end. Babying, coddling takes away from the ability to be prepared. There is a lot of truth, look at the bottom of the page, of practicing on a chessboard or, or a checkerboard. What's the problem with that? Well, they're the same board. If you get really good at playing checkers and you walk into a chess match, you're in trouble. You bring a knife to a gunfight because you just thought you were good. The board looks the same, but the game's changed. If you can't change, if you can't practice in, in the actual game you're going to play, you're not going to be prepared for it when it hits. If that game is fatal, then it becomes a challenge because how do you practice on something that could kill you so that you're ready to go, but train in a way that is real enough that you don't have to die in the training, but it's real enough to prepare you for something that you could die. Now, were we talking about dying and trading? Yes, we are. We're talking about financial death. Guys, I don't know how many thousands, maybe millions, hundreds of thousands, no doubt, of people that have faced financial ruin because of trading. Whether it went to an extreme of gambling or the gambling addiction, but fortunes have been lost by so many, hundreds of thousands of people in trading. Why? Well, because they didn't have the skill to do it right. Well, that's just a few of them. Not that many people died. No, no, no. <laughs> Financially, the majority of people, the majority of people that set out to trade fail. That's the facts. That's the facts. The majority fail, even amongst professionals. Why? Well, because it's dangerous. It is not an easy thing to do, and it plays against your natural instincts, your natural reactions. The things that come natural to you under pressure are almost always wrong in trading. So how in the world do you train to be able to handle that kind of pressure in something that could kill you financially? Well, that's the delicate balance. Do you coddle and mentor and, and make sure nobody ever takes any risk? Or do you just throw them out there and say, well, I'll give you an example. There are trading houses. They, they're, they're called trading rooms or trading houses. Uh, professionals, big companies hire them and they put trading rooms together and they bring people in to trade. And these are people who think that they can trade. They've had some experience and they talk their way into it and they get a seat. And it's kind of like a salesman who gets a chair with a telephone, says, go for it. And if you don't meet your quota, they throw you out and put somebody else in the chair until they find a few people that can meet the quota. In trading rooms, you'll have traders come in there. And I've heard it described to me by professionals as you put five hungry lions in a cage, you throw in three pieces of meat and you see who gets the meat and who gets beat up. And you take the ones who didn't get the meat, you throw them out, you throw two more in and you keep throwing in three pieces until you find the, the very best lions, the, the meanest, nastiest lions. Well, that's what they do with their trading. They don't care if you fail. They just throw people in there and they give them a phone and give them, a, you know, give, them their, give them their trading opportunity. And if they make it, they make it. If they don't, they don't. Too bad. You're gone. That's kind of brutal. So guys, there's a process of learning how to do this 
that is somewhere between the mentor, the full on baby mentor, um, babysitting and sink or swim. You've got to find it. You just have to. And what Rob does here, what I've strived to do for 20 plus years, um, what Trip has learned how to do, guys, this is the process that you're going to have to go through. How do I learn to do something that is inherently dangerous and be prepared for a checkers game or a chess game, whichever one I show up to, because that's what I've been practicing. That's what I've become good at. Because there was a way to train with live, in live fire without getting killed. So special forces, they just take it to the full extreme. They know it's life and death, so they train with live ammunition. Do accidents happen? Occasionally. They try to mitigate it. But if they don't train with live ammunition, the people are not prepared. Okay? Brenda says, what do they do if they lose the company's money? Well, that happens too, and they're gone, usually immediately. Okay? They don't care. They throw in the meat. If the lions get it, they get it. If they don't, they toss the lions and put in another one. All right. All right, here we go. So how do you gain confidence in your trading judgment? I love this. I've heard this before. Confidence is that feeling get, you get just before the roof falls in. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's kind of funny. All right. Maybe a little bit of truth to that maxim. Confidence comes from either ignorance or experience. Guys, there are a lot of people that are confident just because they don't know any better. There's others that are confident because they've gained experience, they've survived, and now they know. When it comes to trading, guys, there is no substitute for experience. But does it have to be fatal? And the answer is no. Does it have to have some level of risk? And the answer is yes. You want the confidence that comes from the latter, from experience. But that live fire experimenting increases your chance of fatality. If you go in there and start trading with the money that you can't afford to lose, there's a good high probability you'll have fatalities. So finding that point where you can get confidence in judgment is going to take live experience. It's got to have some level of risk. It's got to be in that happy zone where you're not being coddled and babysat, but you're also not being thrown to the lions. Repetition is the mother of skill. That's why we said practice makes permanent. Repetition is the mother of skill. If the action is correct, then you get perfect practice. So that's the trick right there. You've got to have lots of repetitions on something that is real. Lots of repetitions with something that's real and developing the actions, correct actions, and re getting them to where they're repeatable. Now, we are going to get into very specifics, but I'm establishing the baselines because if you don't think about this every once in a while, guys, you fall off the wagon. You just do because it is not, this is not the normal way to do things. Certainly not the way we're trained and taught to do a lot of things, but when it comes to something that is lethal, this is where you find that happy medium. So, Pulling the trigger decisively. How do you wind up being able to pull the trigger, make decisions decisively? Guys, fear is paralyzing. If there's fear present, if there's fear present, it's going to impact you in a negative way. Your decision-making is not going to be what it needs to be. How, on the other hand, he who hesitates is lost. Well, that's not the other hand. The other hand is would be those who can pull the trigger confidently. But fear is par paralyzing, and if you hesitate, you're lost. Um, the correlation I was going to tell you that is that when I had the opportunity to meet Steven Seagal, which was clear back in the year 2000, 24 years ago, when I met Sensei Seagal, who's the martial arts uh, movie star, uh, very controversial figure, that's not important. We won't talk about that. But I'll just tell you he's legit. Okay, I won't tell you exactly all the details of why I know he's legit, but he's legit. And when I met with him, we had a, a simple conversation. Actually, we were together for a couple of hours, but there was a couple of simple things that he said that I did not understand at the time. I wrote them down, but I did not understand. It took me years to understand this. But he said, when it comes to 
any uh, in a risky situation where you are at risk in a conflict, if you make it about winning or losing, you're already dead. He said, if you go into a fight, if you go into a conflict that has risk to it, and you go in there having defined that this is a win-lose situation, I have to win. I can't lose. The other person has to lose. He said, if you make it about winning and losing, you're already dead. You're already dead. Well, then how do you survive this? This was profound. He said, if you do the right thing in each moment, the winning takes care of itself. So I wrote it down and it's taken me years to fully grasp what he was implying there. But I can tell you it came from experience. The reason he could say what he said was because of real world experience. When you trade, guys, it is not about winning and losing. You have no control over the outcome of the movement of the stock or the index or whatever it is you're trading, commodity, currencies, whatever it is. You have no control over what it's going to do. Therefore, you can't look at it in terms of trying to control an outcome. What you can control is your risk. You can participate or not. That's a choice. When you participate, there's risk. Can you mitigate the risk? Yes, you can mitigate the risk, but you cannot control the outcome. If the outcome is something that is going to be random, sometimes it will land in your favor. Sometimes it will go against you. You can't do anything about that. Well, I can read a chart and guess, yes, but the key word was guess. Well, I can read a chart and, and know with confidence that it's probably going to, no, you just said the word, probably. Is it going to for sure? Can you guarantee it? No. So it could go against you. Yes. All right. So that's the whole point. It may work. It may not work. The only thing you can control is how much risk you have and how much opportunity you have for uh, success, for it going in your favor. But you can't control it going in your favor or going against you. Therefore, in order to be able to, to pull the trigger decisively, you've got to do it without being afraid. You've got to do it without being hesitant. You've got to do it knowing that there's a risk and being okay with the risk. Guys, how many of you, this is crazy. I, I knew an electrician once that would work with 220 wire, 220 voltage, which is double the voltage of your normal outlet that you would you know, stick your phone into or plug in your light switch or your light cord. And to see if the wires were hot, he would lick his fingers like I just did on his tongue and then touch them. Well, I thought he was nuts because I get hit with 120 and it's really a, a shock. 220 just about knocks you off your feet. Well, turns out he had pretty good calluses on his fingers. And so when he'd do that and just touch, it would get a little buzz and it didn't hurt that bad. Guys, if you had always a situation where if you did, if something went against you, you'd feel it. But the shock was a low voltage shock. It wasn't even 110. If you touch the ends of a battery, just a little battery, like a nine volt battery, you'll feel a little buzz. It's it's just a little tingle. It doesn't even hurt, but you feel something. So that's the point. Being able to pull the trigger decisively, you can't be afraid of the outcome. You can't be afraid. Ooh, ooh, if the power's on, I got to fight. If I touch it, and oh, the power's off. It didn't hurt. That's good. Touch it again. No, the power's off. Oh, good. I'm feeling pretty good about this. You touch it and boom, you get shocked with 120 or 220 volts. Oh my gosh. Now, the next time you go to touch those wires, you're hesitating. You're afraid. Guys, you've got to be able to know and feel that there's risk and it may hurt, but know that you've controlled it to where it's not going to be any more than that nine volt or maybe just a little bit more. But you're not going to die. Uh, it's not going to hurt that bad, but it'll let you know, nope, that one's not going to work. OK, does it mean you failed? No, it just means that one didn't work. If you can't control the outcome, then you shouldn't feel like it's pass or fail. If you make it about winning and losing, you're already dead. You're not going to win. Guys, how can you win a game that you have no control over? 
You can't win, so you can't define it by winning and losing. I, I would ask you again, I've said this before, but I ask you again seriously. I'm looking you right in the eyes. Stop de determining, or excuse me, stop evaluating your trades by wins and losses. Just stop it. You shouldn't do that. You, you don't win. When a trade goes into your favor, you don't win anything. Money goes into your account. That's not winning. That's not win. You didn't win anything. The trade went in your favor. That's it. And when it goes against you, you didn't lose anything. You didn't lose a dime. It just didn't go. It, it went against you. Nothing personal. You had no control over that. You couldn't have stopped it. It did what it did. All you did was control the buzz. Did you get shocked and knocked back on your fanny to where you're scared to do it again? If it happened three times in a row, you'd quit because this is not working. I can't afford this. I can't stand this. I'm losing too much money. I have no confidence now. You see, in order to survive, you have to have a process that allows you to get dinged when it doesn't work to show you that this is going to turn against you sometimes with no uh, personal vendetta or motive. It just didn't work that time. And it's going to hurt a little bit. You can control that. So you've got to cover both sides of a trading outcome. If you can trade with decisively, part of that is that you've got everything covered. I know what's going to happen. If this thing goes against me, I know what's going to happen. It's going to tingle a little bit. I can handle it. If this is neutral, okay, that could happen too. Nothing happens. Or it could go in my favor. And if it does, money is going to go into the account. And I've got an idea of how much that might be. Okay. This, guys, is all, this is, you know, you could look at it and say, Ryan, this is simple. This is repetition. I've heard this before. My gosh, guys. Why did Michael Jordan stay? Why did Michael Jordan stay longer than anybody in practice? Doing layups. Doing simple stuff. The GOAT. The greatest of all time. Why was he the one that was in the gym longer than anybody else and, er, and got there earlier? Okay. Th there's a reason for that stuff. The basics have got to be reiterated. You don't get to say, oh, yeah, we learned that stuff. You know, and if you don't remember this, I'll tell you. Uh, Albert Einstein was asked one time when he visited an eighth grade class, math class, and he and they asked him what he did. And he said, I'm a student of physics or I'm a student of math or something like that. And uh, when he was pressed a little further, he said something about, I think, algebra. And a student says, oh, we already learned that. OK, if Einstein continued to be a student of math and of algebra and trigonometry and all those things, the eighth grader who doesn't know anything except that they got an introduction says, Oh, we, we already learned that stuff. Okay. Guys, repetition is the mother of skill, but it takes perfect practice to get perfect. You have to have risk that hurts, that stings, that bites you when it doesn't work to remind you that this is real, but it doesn't have to be 220 volts. It doesn't have to be a live bullet, but it's got to have something. It's got to hurt or you will never learn properly. You just won't. If you're babied, you will be playing checkers, getting ready to play chess. If you're just thrown in the canal, you might drown. I mean, because there's water in there and it might get in your lungs and you might drown. There might be alligators in there. All right? It, it may work for a lot of people, but some of them, it, it'll be fatal. So it doesn't have to be fatal, guys, but it can't be babysat. Can't be... Um, coddled. Okay. All right. This one looks simple. So how do I get better? Okay. I've got confidence. I, I see how to develop confidence. How do I get more proficient? And that's a great question. Repetition and refinement. There is a process of learn, do, review, or plan, do, review. There's other versions that have four or five different steps. But it's repetition. 
and it's refinement. Refinement means that you adjust, you make adjustments. So with repetition, you make observations, you write it down, you've got a trading plan and you make a copy. You put history in there and you look at it and you go, hmm, I can see a pattern here that needs to be changed. I can see an adjustment that I need to make. Oh, hey, this is working better than I thought. Let's go more this direction. All right. The 10,000 hours, Maxwell, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I just dropped this thing. Uh, it's not Maxwell. It's, I don't think. Anyway, the 10,000 hours, uh, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you very much. Wow, that just escaped me for a second. There's a lot of truth to that, right? I mean, you can back that up. It takes a certain amount of repetition and, and uh, to get the proficiency, to get mastery. So you're going to have to do it. You just got to be able to survive the process. Okay. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, Brenda, that's another way to do it. Identify, enter, manage, and exit. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of good things in there. I love what Tripp said. I appreciate it. He said, I learned this lesson from you years ago. Luckily, it has helped me when watching football games, as I now know that I have no control. I'm just in the stands. I'm in the bleachers. <laughs> Speaking of that, little sidebar here, guys. Little sidebar. This, this, is, uh, this is relevant, but I heard this this week from somebody uh, when I was down in California. And he's a big Chargers fan. Okay. When the San Diego Chargers, that was his thing. And he said, I used to DVR the games every weekend and I wouldn't watch them. I DVR them. And he said, if I found out that the team lost, I would erase the tape. I wouldn't watch it. I would only watch the games that they won. And I went, well, why would you do that? And he said, simple. He said, if I knew that the team was going to win in the end, then when I was watching the game and they made a bad play, I didn't freak out. When they got down and the other team scored two touchdowns in a row and were up ahead of them and looked like the momentum was swinging, I didn't get all wigged out. I, I didn't get my, you know, um, I didn't get my blood pressure up. I didn't uh, yell and scream at the TV because I knew in the end they were going to pull it out somehow. I knew they were going to win. Isn't that an interesting isn't that an interesting perspective? I just thought that was, at first I thought, oh, that's nuts. But um, no, it's not. It's, it's an interesting, if you know that in the end it's going to win, then you can relax, can't you? How could that apply to this? Well, if you know that you've got a four to one risk ratio or a three to one risk ratio, if you know that statistically, if you repeat this process and the, the odds that are in place stay that way, that ultimately you win. Okay. If you knew that you could only have a cost that went against you of a dollar, but on the upside, if it went in your favor, you could get anywhere from one to four dollars. And you knew that statistically, 50% of the time, just flipping a coin, 50-50 might be a reasonable expectation on trading. Okay? So a cost could be a dollar. The benefit could be 4 to $5, well, 3 to $4. It could be 5 or 6 I mean, there's it's open end. Ended. But at least there was a setup that allowed for a reasonable expectation that if it went in your favor, there would be three to four dollars of benefit or gain as opposed to one dollar cost. Now, do the math. If you do 50 50. It works out, guys. It works out. Now, what if the 50 50 didn't play out? What if. What had been historically 50-50, half the trades went in your favor, half went against you. What if it turns out that 60% were going against you and 40% were in your favor? Would you still make money? And the answer is, oh yeah, you would, a lot. What if it dropped down to where 
Seven went against you and only two went in your favor. Well, you still make money. Mathematically, you still make money. So that controlled risk with a detached or a detachment to the outcome, knowing that with the scenario we've set up, this should work. Well, then your confidence goes up. Your ability to take risk goes up. You see? Now, what if things have been working? Everything's doing great. The formula's working, the percentage, the risk, everything. And then suddenly it stops working. Well, then the little kid that says to mom, hey, mommy, mommy, it hurts when I do this. Mommy's going to say, well, quit doing that. Guys, if it doesn't, if it stops working, which is possible. Okay. It's possible that it stops working. Very possible. In fact, probable. Things will go for a while. And then if they don't, what do you do? You stop, quit, quit, you know, mommy, it hurts when I do this. Well, quit doing that. Stop. Well, what do I do? You reevaluate. And maybe this particular stock or index or commodity that you're trading, you stop trading that one. If your formula, it doesn't work. If the ratios are not working, stop doing it. Maybe you reduce the risk. You change the strategy. You back the voltage off to where it's down to, you know, nine volts or six volts, something that's barely perceptible. And you start practicing with a, an adjustment. Did that work? Did that help? Uh, no. Well, let's adjust it again. Try the ratio a little different. Go earlier on the pattern. Go later on the pattern. And when it starts to work again, now you can turn the voltage up and you turn the, re the reward up. So now you can benefit on the ones that go in your favor. Now the odds, it's you're getting at least, you know, four out of 10 that are working in your favor. And it could go the other way, six or seven or eight out of 10. And then boom, you know, you're going, you're, you're rocketing. That's awesome. But your proficiency comes by adjustments. That's it. You don't, don't get cocky. Just because you get three in a row doesn't mean you're magic. It means that you got three in a row. You got lucky. Okay. That's it. Don't take it personal. It's not about winning or losing. You're not suddenly the brain behind the, you know, the green curtain. You're not the wizard of Oz. So you simply repeat back off the risk. If it's getting, if it's not working change. And if that particular stock just isn't working anymore or index, quit doing it. If you got something else that's working, stay with that one. Maybe this one will come back in favor in time. Just leave it alone. You don't have to trade it. Yeah, but I've been trading it for years. Who cares? It's not working right now. Let it go. Let it go. Guys, it's not about winning or losing. You can't get attached to this. It's not a competition. Like Tripp said, you're in the bleachers. You're watching this. You can choose to be in there watching the game or you can leave. You don't have nobody forcing you there, but one thing is for certain, you are not on the field. You're absolutely not on the field. So your proficiency, once you set it up and things start working, can be increased by simply refining. We got a process, it is working, everything's working here. Let's see if we tweak it a little bit, if it'll get better. Oh, oh, oh it's going the wrong way. All right, back off, back off. Let's maybe try this. Oh, hey, that actually worked a little bit. That, that actually, we got a little better. We're getting a little better results. Great. That's how you do it. That's how you survive the process and increase from a proficiency standpoint. That's how you survive. But guys, never, ever lose sight of the fact that you have zero control over the movement of the underlying. Can you have some control over the outcome? Yes, you can, because you control your exposure. You control the upside opportunity. If you limit the upside, well, then you're controlling it. If you leave the upside unlimited, well, then great. You're going to catch a few, a few home runs. Don't expect to be have to have very many. People always talk about their good trades. That's one thing that is really uh, deceiving and deceitful, not on purpose necessarily, 
But if you get a room full of people talking about trading, they're going to tend to talk about the ones that worked and they're going to try to talk each other out of, well, this one, or, you know, I had this great trade, you know, da, da. And, and, and it's like Facebook and other forms of uh, social media, which I despise in, in certain areas, in certain ways, because it's total fake. It's, it's not reality. Everybody's putting forth uh, their uh, a facade of their thing, the, the way in their life that they want to show off. It doesn't show everything, right? And so it's the same way. Um, people will get together and they talk as if, you know, everybody's doing great. Well, you know, everybody has ups and downs. Your process and your objective should be first to survive right? Very first to survive. Then you work on thriving, but you're not going to thrive if you don't survive. So the process, kind of reiterating what we've talked about today, and I'm going to, um, let's see, we can go back the other direction. There we go. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. The learning process, either going to be babied and coddled on one side or thrown into the sharks on the other side. No, neither one of those is a good solution. Um, even if that's the way it's been done, it's not necessarily a good solution. There's something in the middle and you got to find it. That finding it is learning how to have perfect practice. There's got to be something on the line can't be too much, can't be fatal. That means when you trade, there should be something on the line. Maybe it's one contract. Okay, you set your stops to where you know what will happen if this thing turns on you and you can survive it. You, but you know it can hurt. It, it can cost you. Okay. You want to be practicing. If you're going to play checkers, you want to practice on a checkerboard. If you want to play chess, you practice on a chessboard. Oh, hey, they're the same get the board. They are the same board. So you make sure that if you're going to play chess, you practice chess. If you're going to play checkers, you practice checkers. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Your confidence is going to come through experience. Just can't be fatal experience. Okay. Pulling the trigger decisively is going to be knowing that I can afford whatever happens. Okay. Whatever happens, I can afford that. And the odds are in my favor because the risk has been mitigated. The risk is there, but I can stand it. I can handle it. Covering both sides of the trade. Guys, this is where calm comes in. This is where the ability to say, hmm, that was interesting. And that's one of my favorite sayings is that when you can trade so that it goes in your favor and you go, hmm, interesting. That did exactly what it looked like it was going to do. That's great. There's some money went in the account. Or it does nothing. You go, hmm, that's interesting. It didn't do anything. It looked like it was going to go down, but instead of going down or going up, it did nothing. Huh. Interesting. Or you make a trade that is an upside trade and it goes the other direction and you go, hmm, interesting. It looked like it was going up. Everything looked like it. Everything indicated it was going to move up like it did three times before, but it went the opposite direction. Hmm. Interesting. Guys, that is where you've got to be. It's not about winning and losing. It's staying neutral. It's staying neutral. Hmm. Interesting. Not, oh, crap, and Atlee, it did it again. Or spiking the football in the end zone and jumping up and down thinking you're the world, right? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, just looking up at some comments. Trip says, Trip says, that's another great lesson that I got from you was how powerful semantics are to my psychology. Interesting. <laughs> exactly, guys. That whole principle, interesting. That's neutral. That's what we're talking about. Jennifer says, I am practicing that. Good. Good. 
you should be able at the end of every trade, ideally, you should be able to say, hmm, interesting. That one worked. Cool. Hmm. That one did the opposite of what it looked like it was going to do. Interesting. That's it. It shouldn't be any more traumatic than that. That's what I mean when I try to teach people neutral trading. It's not personal. You didn't win, you didn't lose. Because you can't win or lose in a game that you have no control of the underlying. The only thing you can control, like Tripp said, is am I in the stands watching this game or am I going to leave? I don't like this game. I'm not going to watch it anymore. And I love that little idea that my friend had. They said, I only watch the games that I know what the outcome is going to be. As much as that rubbed me wrong at first, I'm going, wait a minute, I get it. And guys, you should only be doing trades that you know the outcome. You know the outcome. If this thing goes against me, it's going to cost me 150 bucks. Okay, I know that because my stops are in place. If it goes in my favor, it could make anywhere from four to five to eight hundred dollars. Okay, let's find out what happens. Wow, that was interesting. That one actually worked, or that was kind of kind of a, almost a break even on that one. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Next, that's what it's got to be. Okay, Brenda says me too. I'm practicing that too. All right. Uh, guys, we've got a couple of minutes. I'm going to switch the screen share over to, um, come on. There we go. And you should, should see the chart pop up here. Got them. Should be looking at the charts now. And I should be able to see the chat, but I can't. Let me find how, where that went. Here we go. All right, we're good now. Okay, so uh, if you will, pull up any stock that you guys want to take a look at, and we'll do a little evaluation of it. Um, this this is interesting with NVIDIA with their split. See how it looks like it's been totally flat. You want to see something interesting? This is what you need to do if you if you haven't done this already. Watch what happens when we take the split out. Now we could adjust the whole chart, but I want to just bring it into play this way. So where it looked very flat because of the split, in reality, this is what's happened you take that one more boom right there okay so i'll just start with this one uh until somebody gives me a man yeah, let me get this text chat where i can see it oh wow okay that was fast so brenda pops the spy in okay we can do that but we'll just we'll look at this while we got it so what's happening with nvidia now that's down in the hundred dollar range you can afford to maybe traded a little bit more in terms of number of shares because the price said they did 10 to one split. Um, how would you characterize what's happening with NVIDIA here? What does it look like to you? What's been the reaction after their split? For the first month, we bobbed back and forth between about 120 and 140 back and forth, back and forth. And when it came down on the second time, it gapped down and tried to fill the gap, which it did. As soon as it did, it dropped and we pushed down to a new low, a lower low. Okay, so negative reaction, Jennifer says lower lows and lower highs. Correct. Right now we have lower highs and lower lows. All right. When we have a uh, trend line that is moving down, we do something like this. We always draw the top line, not the bottom line. If it's an uptrend, we draw the bottom line versus the top line. You know that. Okay. Now, the other thing we want to do 
is just for the heck of it, we double click that line, we bring it down to the first rotation down and we look for correlation. Okay, do we have it? And the answer is, yeah, we kind of do, we do. Because if you look right in here, the end of July, we go one, two, three, four days where we try to hold this correlation. The number of dollars down on the downstroke was the same. They dug in and instead of bouncing, it slips through, okay? There's one day reaction trying to grab back up and, and get started again. But the day before, which took us down below the trend and stayed there overnight, they tried to rally back up. There was not enough support. And so we have to go down and find a new support level, which they did with a gap. This opened with a big gap, traded back up, climbed back up inside the range, had a nice big run from, gosh, we went from 75 all the way up to 100 and, 100 and maybe 30, okay? Not quite double, but darn near. And that's a lot, guys, there's a lot of money can be made between 75 and 130. And we get up and we hit our head against the wall. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And after banging your head against the wall eight times and not being able, or the ceiling and not being able to get through, it's time to take a breather. So that's what's happening. Taking a break. Now, how far down does it go? Well, we've had one, two rotations on this pattern. And we're starting into a third. Patterns tend to go three to five times before they break down or change. So what's going to happen now? I don't know. I can tell you if it follows the pattern, what's going to happen, but I can't tell you what's going to happen. If it follows the pattern, we should see a push down to this range down here around 105, 106, 107 in this range again. And if it bounces off of this, this will be the one, two, third rotation. And then the challenge would be if it comes back up to the trend line that's developing here. That would be one way. If it follows the pattern, we would see a dip down a little bit farther and then a push to the upside. Okay. Now, how big was this run from this jump down here of $90 up to 130? That's a $40 run. Over here, we had a 118 up to 135. That's an $18 run. Here, we also had an $18, $20 run. So there's an 18, $20, 18 to $20, pull back, pull back. We have a big drop and then we have a big recovery of 40 bucks. Okay. So now, what if it didn't go down all the way down to this range of 105, 106? What if it stopped here around 115, 112, and then turned and headed back up? What would that look like to you? What would you start to anticipate might happen? Okay, and I'm just talking to you about patterning. If instead of pushing all the way down, it stopped partway and then pushed back up to test again, would that be kind of bullish or kind of bearish to you? What would it look like to you? I'm not asking you what you think. I'm saying, what would it look like? Brenda says bullish. Why? If it turns around and comes back up here to 125 and stops at this blue line, as if we magically drew a, put a fence up, if it came up and stopped there, would that be bullish or bearish? I agree with Brenda, because instead of going all the way down, the buying pressure is coming back in partway down. Well, what does that mean? I don't know, but it's interesting. And when it got up to that blue line, if it gets up to that blue line again there, I'm going to be very interested in trading. Which way? I don't know. If it breaks out across the line, anything above 130, I would be in it. If it breaks and then turns around and, and gets stuck in this 127, 128 range and then turns around and falls again, that's bearish to me and I'd play it to the downside. But I like to trade off of what we call pivot points, what I call pivot points. This area right in here, this 126 to 128, that's a pivot point. There was how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days. 
eight days where it traded into a real tight box right there. That left a, that leaves a mark. Everybody who trades Nvidia remembers those eight days. The bullish ones that rode up 40 bucks wanted it to keep going. It didn't. The bearish ones that wanted it to go down, it didn't. It just got stuck for eight days. It finally broke through. Where's it going to go? Well, if it goes all the way down to this area, to the blue line support, it'll make sense. It'll you need to look for a bullish rally. If it stops partway through and starts to head back up again, then I am getting excited because all of this congestion has a lot of interest in people who like playing NVIDIA. And there is going to be probably, there's likely going to be a big push out of there. Either they come back and say, no, we don't want to support this price. All right, we got to go farther and find a place where the support will come in. Or we were just blowing off steam. This didn't really bother us. Well, then where do we go? Let's go up. If nobody wants to go down, let's go up. Guys, the herd will move. The crowd will move. So you've got to be there. You've got to position yourself, have the a fair amount of risk that you can stand with a four to one ratio to the upside and then sit back and go, wow, that was interesting. Okay, that was interesting. But that's the way you, you analyze this, guys. And you get good at it by practicing it. You write those scenarios down and you play them out. And if it turns out that you can start to get pretty good at evaluating it, and then you play it forward and go, okay, yeah, that, that kind of went the way the way it looked like it was going to go. Uh, then, hey, you know, I, I must have read that pretty good. You know, I didn't predict what it was going to do. Or excuse me, I didn't say what it was going to do. I just predicted what the outcome could be. And look at that. All right, what did you want to see on the S&P? Brenda, because we have just a couple minutes to address this. What do you see happening right now with the S&P, guys? We just got through talking with it. Does this not look similar to that little box that we had with NVIDIA before it broke out today? How many days? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So on the ninth day, NVIDIA broke down. On the ninth day, S&P is still stuck in that box. Same congestion, Jennifer says, exactly. Same congestion. And it is not without precedent. Okay, we have a very significant ceiling here with the S&P, very significant. Broke down, found support, came rallying back up. Big, strong move and hit its head hard. Bam. <laughs> That's a hard ceiling. Pounding your head against the ceiling for eight days in a row, now nine days in a row, takes a toll. You either break through the ceiling or you fall down, right? With a big headache and you go take an aspirin and lay down. That's the history. And that is significant with the S&P because if you look back, we do have history of consolidations. Do this again. There we go. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then we break out. What was the test on the breakout? Oh, they broke to the downside, but that was just a pressure relief. And they go, oh no, no, no. We we didn't say we wanted to to go down. Oh, okay. So it takes off and makes another lift. Then we go. What? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And then it breaks out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we break down. And now we are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So I see just in the last three months, one, two, and we didn't count this one, but that's another one, three, four, five times the S&P consolidates for what? Seven to 10 days before it releases. 
So the last three months, five times, seven to 10 days, and then a release, pressure release. Okay. So what does that tell you? It tells you the history. Does it predict the future? It suggests that we have this pattern going on. And until it stops, you play the pattern. Find the pattern, play it till it breaks. Write that down. That's a Ryan euphemism. Find the pattern, play it till it breaks. So what is the likelihood? Well, we've been in a climbing mode. Now we are double tapping our head against here. So either the S&P traders are going to decide that this is not worth the effort. We can't get anybody to push this thing any farther. So in order to make money, let's take it back down to a support level and then bring it back up. We make money both ways. And that's exactly what they'll do. People that can have some influence will trade something down to find support just so that they can write it back up. They don't care which way it goes. What they hate is what it's doing right now, which is nothing. Just getting stuck in a box. All right. People are positioning themselves for the next move, either up or down. They're jockeying for position. They're taking bets. They're, they're lining up, looking to see how many people, you know, what, what the signals are. Is there support here? Is there going to be a large uh, support when this breaks to the upside? Well, let's find out. Let's, let's push the buttons and push the market a little bit, see what happens, either up or down, see who comes to play. That's what will likely come out of this. What? If it follows the pattern. So there's the qualifier. I don't know what it's going to do. I know what it has done. Therefore, I know what it's likely to do if it follows the pattern. But if it doesn't follow the pattern, then I don't know. Unless there's another pattern. Find a pattern, play it till it breaks. Guys, this is the process. This is neutral. This is where you, you can look at it as fun. And as soon as you put money on it, it doesn't seem fun anymore. It's either highs or lows emotionally, but it shouldn't be. This is just interesting, isn't it? It's interesting to, to dig out, to ferret out the patterns, what's going on, and then put yourself in a position to find out what's going to happen. If I have a four to one upside, then I know what my risk is. I know what the reward ratio is. I know I'm in good position. I know exactly what it'll cost if it doesn't work. I'm okay with that. But I know what it could do if it does work, and I'm okay with that. Great. Let it rip. Let it rip. That's all you can do, guys. Jennifer says, uh, Ryan, you I believe you have the best analysis. Well, I've always enjoyed this. I'm glad you enjoy it as well. Uh, this is my happy place is to sit and analyze and find patterns and lay out strategies. Um, it's fun. I love it. Anyway, guys, we're done. Uh, Brenda says that's why he's the coach. Well, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Thanks, Trip. Thanks, everybody. Guys, God bless. Have yourself a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend coming up, and we'll see you when we see you. Bye-bye.